Okay. So. So this morning we uh, we've come here and practice some meditation and listen to some dhamma. And it's amazing. You know, I've been in, in Buddhist countries for so many years now. I've probably spent almost as much time in Asia as I've spent in my own country. In fact, I've probably spent more time in Asia in the last 20 years than I've spent in my own country. And I'm actually quite amazed at how many people in Asian countries don't even go into the temples. You know, uh, in, in Thailand, as you can imagine, any of you who've been there, you've seen it for yourselves, there's practically a temple on every corner. <laughs> and there's a lot of people, the Thais like to eat. I don't know if anybody knows this, but the Thai, they snack. The, the Thais are a nation of snackers. Uh, Everywhere you go, there's little stores that sell little knickknacks of, of food, you know, stuff on a stick. Uh, and the tires always, you know, they walk down the road and they'll buy some from here, buy some. You know, they love to. So I'm amazed they're not fat. But you often see outside the temples these stalls set up, food stalls, people selling amulets, all these sorts of things. And so they actually see the temple as a place of profit. They park outside the temple, they can make money. People go into the temple, they come out, they're feeling a bit hungry. Or maybe you buy yourself a, a Buddha amulet and then go inside and ask the monks to bless your amulet to protect you from whatever it is that you want to be protected from. But they never actually go into the temple and, and, and practice and never go into the temple and listen to the Dhamma. When I first became interested in Buddhism it was in um, it was actually in northern India, a place called Dharamsala, uh, which is the home of the Dalai Lama. And uh, that's yeah, that's where I first heard uh, Buddhism taught. And I remember, I've been traveling India, I used to go to India just about every year I'd go and spend six months in India. When I got into Dharamsala, I recognized some beggars from Pushkar. So they traveled quite a long way to get to Dharamsala. Now this time of the year the Dalai Lama, because it's the Tibetan New Year, the Dalai Lama is in town. And he does these you know, two-week public teachings. They're free to get in. And the Dalai Lama sits there for two weeks every day and teaches the Dhamma. And so you go down this hill to the Dalai Lama's temple. And the entire hill is lined with beggars. Also outside the temple, you've got the beggars, and you've also got people selling things like momos. And I got talking to one of these beggars that I knew from Pushkar. So, what, what brings you here? See, these beggars, they, they can get free transport in India. Free trains and stuff like that. And one of the guys said to me, well, the Dalai Lama's on town. Oh yeah, that's bad. That's true, you know. He said, there's lots of money to be made. Because um, <laughs> I figure all these good Buddhists are going to be giving them a few rupees as they go up and down the hill. And none of them went inside to listen to the teachings of the Dalai Lama. And you know, that, to me that's a shame we have a, a human rebirth. Even if you're born a beggar, you know, listening to the Dharma is not going to do you a lot of harm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's fortunate, you know, I'm always pleased when I see people come into the temple. And amongst some of the faces here, they're very, very 
the media in the five odd months that I've been here in Malaysia and I've come to know the people who are here regularly especially because I see a lot of them at breakfast time huh? <laughs> starting to feel a bit peckish <laughs> so I know the faces of the people that come to feed me so <laughs> but no it's, it, it, it's great to see people coming in and it's especially wonderful to see people coming in taking the eight precepts and, and wanting to spend some time in, in meditation. So, one of the questions I'm, I'm often asked is whether or not meditation is Buddhist. And to be perfectly honest, no it's not. I mean meditation was around before the Buddha. People have been meditating for a lot longer than the last 2,600 years. And in fact, we know that the Buddha himself, while yet an unenlightened bodhisattva, was practicing meditation. And uh, his teachers, they were renowned as some of the best teachers in the area at the time. So we, we can see that meditation is not necessarily a Buddhist thing. But there is a thing that I call Buddhist meditation. And the difference between Buddhist meditation and any, and any other type of meditation is the Dharma. Without the Dharma there is no enlightenment. See this is why for six years the Buddha practiced and got basically nowhere. You know, he attained certain states. But we know that he kept leaving his teachers because although they were considered the best, he would get to the stage that they could teach to and they would say, well that's it, there is no more. And the Buddha figured there must be more because there was still suffering. He still didn't know the way out of suffering. And so we can see that his teachers didn't have proper understanding because the Dharma had not yet been rediscovered. And I'll say rediscovered because the Buddha did not discover the Dharma. The Dharma had just kind of been lost. You know? A bit like Angkor Wat. You know? Angkor Wat wasn't discovered because it had been there for a long time. You know? But it was rediscovered, you know, when those guys went in and suddenly found these buildings in amongst all the trees and the weeds and everything else. You know? And this is what it was like with the Dharma. The Buddha rediscovered the Dhamma and he taught the Dhamma. And we know that when he first met up with his five buddies after his enlightenment, he taught them the Dhamma. And of course we all know that Kandana became a stream enterer immediately. And this causes a lot of people to say, oh, well, you know, Kondana attained the stream. He wasn't meditating. Actually, Kondana was a meditator. He'd been meditating for a long time. And it was hearing the Dharma that allowed him to enter the stream. And then afterwards, they all entered the stream and then became Arahants. And so it was because of the Dharma. So we can see that we need the Dharma. So, the next thing is, uh, a lot of people, you know, I ask them, you know, what do you want to get out of your meditation? Which is a bit of a trick question. Because they all immediately say, oh, I want a calm mind, I want peace, I want enlightenment, I want, I want, I want. That's ego. <laughs> There are such things as good desires, wholesome desires. The desire for enlightenment is a wholesome desire. But again, it's something that we can't cling on to. And I remember after the Parinibbana of the Buddha, we know that three months later there was going to be the first council. 500 arahats 
we're going to come together and they were going to go through everything the Buddha had ever taught so that it could be memorized and, and handed down because this is the way most ancient traditions actually handed things down was through word of mouth and people knew the stories they knew the stories word for word and this is how a lot of the Native American history was handed down this way uh, the Aboriginal history of Australia the Maori history of New Zealand many of these countries it's, it's a verbal way of keeping things going. A lot of these people didn't have a writing, you know. The Maoris had carvings, the cavemen had pictures, but you know, the stories were handed down. The, the old fellows told it to the little techers, the little kids, to keep the traditions alive. And so we knew that these there was going to be this council of Arahants. But we needed Ananda, Venerable Ananda. I like Venerable Ananda. <laughs> He's just so human. <laughs> he really is. 20 years with the Buddha and he was a Sotapanna. <laughs> you know? and that means we've got hope yet. You know, you'd, you'd think 20 years with the Buddha, you'd become an arahant. Oh no, he was a Sotapanna, good old Venerable Ananda. But he needed to be at this council, and it was very important that Ananda was at this council. And so he meditated and meditated and meditated. But in the back of his mind, there was always, I must become enlightened, I must become an Arahant. And it didn't happen, he just remained as he was. Probably getting more and more frustrated as I was getting closer and closer. And then it says in the suttas on the night before the council was due to take place, it says Ananda was doing walking meditation. I imagine, you know, walking, 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 must become an errand, walking, must become an errand, walking, I need to become an errand. And nothing was happening. And eventually he got really, really tired. And at that stage, he decided he was going to have a bit of a lay down. He needed to have a bit of a lay down. And it's interesting because the man that, as far as I can make out, is the only person in the suttas who was neither standing nor laying down when he attained enlightenment. He was kind of on his way to his bed. <laughs> he was on his way down and he became an arahant. He'd actually, for that moment in time, he'd given up the desire for enlightenment and it took place. So we have to be very careful about our desires. You know, as I say, it's a, it, it's a wholesome desire, but it can still, it's still a desire, it's still a craving, you know. So, and as I say, people, they say, oh yeah, I want a peaceful mind, I want a calm mind. But in actual fact, that's not why we meditate. We meditate to get rid of things. We meditate to get rid of greed, lust. Meditate to get rid of anger. And we meditate to get rid of the ego. <laughs> you can see, we don't meditate to get anything. The reason why we don't meditate to get anything is we've actually got all the things that we want. We just can't find them. And I often say, a lot of you people have got cars, huh? you know. And how many times have you lost your car keys? So where are the keys? You know, so you do start doing that, you know, patting the pockets several times, mm -hmm. just in case you've missed it the first time. And you go outside, and you look inside the car, no, they're not in the ignition. Mm -hmm. They're not hanging in the door. You know you must have the key somewhere because your car is parked in the driveway. Uh, so you must have got it home. So you start searching for the keys. And eventually you go to the coffee table and you've got the Sun newspaper and the Star and Vogue magazine and all. And I'm chucking them away, chucking. And they're sitting on the table are your car keys, exactly where you put them. But you just cover them with a load of rubbish. 
And that's what our minds are like. They are actually pure. They are actually tranquil. But in this lifetime, and in previous lifetimes, we just covered them in so much rubbish that we can't see the luminous mind, even though it's there. And so we have to start taking the garbage out. Now some people think that we take to the garbage with a shovel. You know, if you shovel goes boom, there it is, jhana. <laughs> nah. It's more like using a toothpick. <laughs> it takes time. It takes a fair bit of time. But it doesn't matter, you know. We, we put the time in. Like I said this morning, the more, more you put into your practice, the more you get out of your practice. You know, you do see a lot of people, you know, they go on these 10 day meditation courses. And, you know, they, they sort of seem to go in thinking, you know, day one, first jhana, day two, second jhana, and, you know, right up through the ninth jhana, and <laughs> onwards and upwards, you know, and they're just going to levitate their way out of the thing and after 10 days. And then they get very disappointed <laughs> because well, they haven't gotten up to that stage. And we were talking this morning under the Bodhi tree about keeping the precepts. See, this is another thing I, and I've seen this myself personally. I've actually heard meditation teachers say, you don't need the Dharma to maintain enlightenment. I actually heard them say the Dharma is a hindrance. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> haven't quite worked that one out yet, but they won't teach the Dharma. They say, no, we only teach meditation. Well, it doesn't work. You need to know why you're meditating. Mm -hmm. And also you get people, they, they, they go onto these courses, and I'm guilty of it myself in the past. I've gone on to 10 day retreats, and the day before, I've been out partying as hard as I possibly can with my friends. I mean, the Thai used to be fascinated by the amount of alcohol I could ch consume. You know, I used to go to these places and they didn't charge you for every beer that you bought. They'd bring you a bottle, you know, those big bottles of beer, big bottles of chan, and they'd put it on the table and you drink that and, you know, give me another one. And they'd keep them on the table, all the empties. And so when you're ready to leave, they just start to count, you know. And then sometimes I'd get up to my table and be like, one, two, three, five, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. How you can drink this much? It's hot. <laughs> it's not a problem. And that's what I'd be like. I'd, I'd be out partying all the time. And I'd say like, you know, I could be out until two o'clock in the morning of the morning I was going to start my course, and then go and take precepts <laughs> and sit down to meditate and of course you would have problems I mean you know I spend half my time thinking about my friends out there partying <laughs> oh, that'd be nice or a hot day I could fancy a beer all of these things go through your mind that's what I was saying about the importance of trying to keep the precepts because if we don't keep the precepts we can't possibly calm our minds down. Like I said, of course, we do make mistakes from time to time. But we just realize that, you know, we are on precepts, didn't quite get it right this time. That's okay. We regret the fact that we got it wrong, so we don't carry guilt with us. For those of you who've not heard this before, <laughs> I often say, you know, guilt is like, you know, when you've got a day bag or a backpack on your back and you do something you, sh you know you shouldn't have done. And so, you know, oh man, and you pick up a brick or a big rock and you stick it in your day bag and you continue walking. And you do something else you shouldn't have done, right? So you pick up another brick or another rock and you put it in your day bag. And you just get heavier and heavier and heavier. This is guilt. Guilt weighs upon us, you see. But and that's what I 
I say Buddhists, we, we don't do guilt. We do regret. So we break a precept and we go, oh man, wasn't supposed to do that, huh? <laughs> I'll try harder. We can retake the precept and we try harder to keep it. You know, I used to do it when I first became a Buddhist. I was, uh, oh, I was determined I was going to be a good Buddhist. Mm. And so I used to take precepts every morning. I had this little Buddha statue. I actually traveled around the world with it. My Buddha statue is very well traveled Buddha statue. Been all over the place. Mm. I even used to get him out sometimes on the airplane, let him look out the window. <laughs> 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 uh, out in the taxi, put him up the front so he couldn't look out the windscreen. Oh, mm. Mm. <laughs> Temple. <laughs> When I used to get up in the morning and I'd take five precepts every Monday to Thursday I would take five precepts Friday, Saturday, Sunday I'd get up and I'd take four precepts because <laughs> <laughs> there's a good chance I'd go out drinking with my buddies <laughs> and I'd kind of worked out that if I didn't want to break a precept, then I shouldn't take it. <laughs> <laughs> but occasionally I would get it wrong. Occasionally I'd be, I'd be out of work during the week with, you know, and it'd be a hot day. I used to pick fruit a lot, you know. I'd be working outside in the sun in the summertime picking fruit. And you have to work really hard because you get paid for how much you pick. It's not an hourly rate. You know? So you really got, if you want to make money, you've got to work hard. And yeah, it could be a really hot day and sort of you're on your way home and you might say, oh, let's pop into the pub for a beer. Oh, yeah, pop into the pub would be a good idea. So you go and you'll be starting to drink your first half litre and all of a sudden, oh, I'm on precepts. So what are you going to do? It's okay, you broke it. You try harder the next time. You try to remember that during the week, <laughs> if you were playing games with the precepts, like I was, we try not to drink. Mm. Eventually I actually learned that, you know, just because I didn't say a precept, you're still breaking them even if you don't say them. Because you know, it's, it's not a case of words, it's a case of, of how we live our lives. So, we know there are a lot of different types of meditation around. I mean, I started off in the Vajrayana, in the Tibetan tradition, and their meditation is a lot different to the type of meditation that we do here. Uh, there's Hindu meditation, which is also different. You know, as the Thais would say, same, same, but different. Uh, you know. So there are many, many different types. And even in the Theravada tradition, you know, we've got different teachers teaching different things. I was talking to uh, one lady here one day and she was very confused because somebody had once said to her, all you need to do is chant. Somebody else said, all you need is the Dharma. Somebody else said, all you need is meditation. And I said to her, I said, when people are telling you that all you need is this and you don't need that, I said, then they've got an ego problem. <laughs> I said, you want to walk away from them. But in actual fact, I often say to people, well, what was the Buddha doing when he attained enlightenment? He certainly wasn't listening to the Dharma because he hadn't rediscovered it at that stage. <laughs> you know, though it was the Dharma rediscovered that gave him enlightenment. He wasn't chanting. He was actually meditating. But having said that, there's nothing wrong with chanting. Absolutely nothing on what you think. And a lot of people start their meditation off with chanting. You know, whether it's just a bit of namo tasa or whatever it is, some people chant. You know, I don't know if they do it down here, but in Thailand a lot of people do Buddha, 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 Buddha. It's a chant. And it can calm the mind down. 
But we're not just looking for a calm mind. We need to go further. We need to go deeper than just a calm mind. But these things are okay. If we have a calm mind, then it's very easy to start out our meditation practice. And so for a lot of people, that's what they do. Um, there's there's um, the meditation they like to call vipassana meditation. And that's, um, that's another form of meditation which you know, we start to get into big arguments about vipassana versus samatha. <laughs> um, but I can't be bothered. Mm-hmm. Um, for a lot of people, we pass in our works. And so, how can it be a bad meditation if it works? You know, we do need the Dharma. The Dharma is very important. The Dharma lets us know why we are meditating. Mm-hmm. It lets us know what the practice of meditation is all about. And of course, the ultimate goal for Buddhists is Nibbana. We don't meditate to go to heaven. If you want to go to heaven, it's churches next door. But as we know, heaven is not forever. Heaven is impermanent. Nice place to hang out. Everything you need is there. But in heaven, we're not actually accumulating any virtuous karma. Mm. We're just using up all the virtuous karma that got us there in the first place. And so we don't know when we, when our time is up in heaven, we could be heading for a lower realm, which isn't the greatest thing for us to be heading for. You know, so here we are, we're in the human realm. Not only are we in the human realm, but you're in a country that actually allows you to practice your own religion. Some countries wouldn't allow this. You know? I mean, Malaysia is basically a Muslim nation. And I can tell you there's a lot of Muslim nations that if you tried to practice Buddhism, you'd be in big trouble. You know? and you've been born at a time when the teachings of the Buddha are still around. You have your faculties, you can understand the teachings of the Buddha. So this is what we would call a noble rebirth. We've accumulated so much karma in our past lives that we are here today able to sit in a Buddhist temple without fear of persecution and we can listen to and practice the Dhamma. And so, what we need to do now is understand what exactly it was that the Buddha taught. So, we're going to have a look quickly at the Anapanasati Sutta. Just a good word, Sati. As we all know, Sati means mindfulness. Now, I know there's a lot of other translations out there, people retranslating the word sati. But I'm quite happy with the word mindfulness. But what we have to remember here is sati is not general mindfulness. See, general mindfulness, when you guys drove here today, you had general mindfulness. You were watching the vehicles in front of you you're watching the vehicles trying to cut in in front of you, at the side of you. You have to watch out for pedestrians that might come across. So this is general mindfulness. Your mind is looking at many, many different things. And general mindfulness is what we need. There's nothing wrong with general mindfulness. If you don't have it, you weren't going to get here this morning. You were going to be in a car wreck. Mm-hmm. So we need general mindfulness. But sati, sati is not general mindfulness. Sati is fixing your attention on one particular object and keeping it there. Venerable Dhamma Udo refers to it as remembering. Remembering to stay on one particular object. And it's just bringing your focus of attention. You have one point of attention. 
So we're not chasing from here to here to here to here to here. So we'll just have a quick look at the Yamapana Saiki Sutta. Okay, so before we start, we've just got some notes here. The meditation on in and out breathing is the first subject of meditation expounded by the Buddha in the Maha Satipatthana Sutta, the great discourse on the foundations of mindfulness. Now, I actually don't particularly like the word foundations of mindfulness. I would prefer object of mindfulness. But still, if you understand it as foundations, I'm not going to get pedantic here. Mm-hmm. I'm not here to retranslate the Bible. So the Buddha laid special tra- stress on this meditation, for it's the gateway to enlightenment and nirvana adopted by all Buddhists of the past as the very basis for the attainment of, of Buddhahood. When, if you read the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha actually refers to it as the one-way path. Not the only path, because there's actually an eightfold path. Uh, uh, and, of course, we know that this is only one of the eight. So it's not the only path, but it's it's a one-way path. It can only lead to Nibbana. It can't lead you to lower realms. <laughs> so when the Blessed One stood at the foot of the Bodhi tree and resolved not to rise until he reached enlightenment, he took up Anapanasati as his subject of meditation. And on the basis of this, he, f- he attained the four jhanas, recollected his previous lives, understood the nature of samsara. He aroused insight and knowledge, and at dawn, while a hundred thousand world systems trembled, he attained the limitless wisdom of a fully enlightened one. So the text is basically here. Um, here a monk, a monk has gone to the forest, or to the foot of a tree, or to an empty place, sits down cross-legged, holding his back erect, arousing mindfulness in front of him. So although it says here monks, no, a monk has gone, it actually refers to any of the four types of individuals, which is a bhikkhu, a bhikkhuni, upasaka, or upasika. It's not the domain of monks. So anybody desirous of practicing meditation, just go to the forest, to a tree, and then you sit down cross-legged, stay in an upright position, and bring your mindfulness. When it says bring your mindfulness to the front, a lot of people think, oh, that means the tip of the nose, or the top of the lip. But I actually believe it means just bringing it to that one point. So we're not looking to the side, we're not looking past it, we're not looking behind it. It's just focusing on like, I have this bottle of drink here, and now I can look directly at this bottle of drink. That's bringing my mindfulness, you know. Not going off in this direction, not going off in that direction. I've only got one object and one object only. And it says, if he breathes in a long breath, he should comprehend this with full awareness. If he breathes out a long breath, he should comprehend this with full awareness. If he breathes in a short breath, he should comprehend this with full, with full awareness. If he breathes out a short breath, he should comprehend this with full awareness. If he breathes in experiencing the whole body, he breathes out experiencing the whole body. That is, with well-placed mindfulness, he sees the beginning, the middle, and the end of the two phases of the in-breath and of the out-breath. As he practices watching the in-breath and the out-breath with mindfulness, he calms down and tranquilizes the two functions of the breathing in and breathing out. Our Buddha illustrates this with a simile. When a clever turner or his apprentice works an object on his lathe, he attends to this task with fixed attention. In making a long turn or a short turn, he knows that he's making a long turn or a, or a short turn. In the same manner of the practitioner of meditation breathes in a long breath, he comprehends it as such. 
and he breathes out a long breath, he comprehends it as such. Now, it's important to understand here that, first of all, we do not try to control the breath. See, some, some people have translated the Anapana Sati Sutta, and then when they teach Anapana Sati meditation, they say, do some long breaths in, do some long breaths out, do some short breaths in, do some, that's not what the sutta says. There's nothing in the sutta that says that we do this. It says, knowing I'm breathing along, knowing I'm breathing out long, knowing I'm breathing in short. So however your breath is, if it's a short breath, we just know that it's a short breath. If it's a long breath, we just know it's a long breath. It doesn't say to do long and short. You know? Because when we start to do long and short, then we start to fabricate things. They become mind-made. I'm going to breathe in long, I'm going to breathe out long. And that's not what the Buddha taught us. The Buddha taught us to be aware of the breath. Now, just on a side note, and I'm, I'm not here to offend, people who do vipassana meditation. But I have a problem with meditation where you note the breath. You see, in, in, in some meditation, some vipassana meditation courses, they focus on the rising of the abdomen. And people are taught to note rising, 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 falling, falling. But you see, I would suggest that you're not actually watching the rising and the falling of the abdomen. You're watching the word rising and you're watching the word falling. The mind can only take in one thing at a time. So we should just know that the abdomen is rising as opposed to noting that the abdomen is rising. You know? I think this is a fault that some meditation teachers do teach because I fail to see how we can note rising and no rising at the same time. It would be the same if you were trying to note breathing and breathing and breathing and you're actually noting a word. Now that will bring you to a degree of calmness but you're not actually watching the breath. You're not aware of the breath, you're aware of a word. And in actual fact, you're making this word up in your mind. And the whole idea of meditation is to stop making things up in the mind, is to get rid of these things in the mind. And so it's a case of knowing. So when we breathe in, we just know breathing in. We're just aware of it. And when we breathe out, we're aware of breathing out. So we're not noting it, and nor are we controlling it. You see, we don't have to control the breath. We don't even have to, I mean, if we had to control our breath, we'd actually probably all die because we'd be so busy thinking of other things, we'd forget to breathe. <laughs> and it's quite important for living. Uh, and so, so we don't control our breath, we just breathe. The thing about breathing, though, is most of the time we're not even aware of the fact that we breathe. We don't spend 24 hours a day thinking, I am breathing. We're busy thinking about other things. But Anapanasati is great because you can do Anapanasati anywhere. And you can do it especially when you're sitting or standing. It's very easy to do Anapanasati, you know, the, the, the four major postures. You know, sitting, standing, walking and laying down. And sitting or standing is very, very easy to do Anapanasati. Walking, it's a bit different because when we're walking, we're actually more aware of the movement of going forward, the movement of going back, as opposed to because sometimes people say, Well, when I do walking meditation, can I be aware of the walking and be aware of the breathing? No, you can't. You can only, you can only be aware of one thing at a time, you know, that's all the mind will allow. Now, that's why I'm sorry, you know, I mean. I don't mean to offend the ladies, but you know, you can't multitask, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. 
You don't tell me off because Buddha said it, okay? I'm just <laughs> I'm taking refuge in the Buddha right here. <laughs> you know, you can't multitask. Yeah, ladies are very good at doing more than one task at a time. They're a lot better than us men. See, because that goes back to caveman times, eh? You see, during the caveman time, see, us blokes, we had to go out, you know, hunt, you know, and we'd go out and we'd kill something, we'd bring it back and we'd give it to the wife and cook. <laughs> so she had to skin it and clean it and cut it and cook it while looking after the kids making sure that fire didn't go out because the fire was really good. So she had to do quite a few jobs, everyone. But we hunted. Mm -hmm. uh, time to relax. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We'd we done our job. <laughs> uh, so now the lady had to do her bit. So she got quite used to doing quite a few different things. But you can actually, your mind would only let you do one thing at a time. Um, although it appears like sometimes we're doing more than one task. And our bosses all seem to think that we can do several jobs at once. Huh? <laughs> and the boss, I'll do this, 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 and when you finish that, come and see me and I'll give you something else to do. <laughs> Thank you very much. You know, but we can't. And if our boss would let us do one thing at a time, we'd actually find, or she, would actually find that we can do the job a lot better if they let us do one job and then move on to the next task. But otherwise we just do, we do several jobs, but none of them are as good as they possibly could be because we're not fully focused on each job. So no offense ladies, but you can't actually multitask. You know, so he exercises his awarenesses to see the beginning, the middle and the end of these two functions of breathing in and breathing out. So we know the beginning of the breathing in, we know the duration of the breathing in, and we know the cessation of the breathing in. Now a lot of people say we should you know, be doing the tip with the nose and all this sort of stuff. But that's actually quite difficult for a lot of people. They can't even feel that sensation. You know? So it's not necessary. Some people say the roof of the mouth. You know, you know, it's like the Buddha doesn't actually say that. And as I say, for some people it becomes rather difficult. It's, it, it can be such a subtle sensation you know, that they would just get frustrated if you tried to tell them to do this. And so I don't bother telling people to do this. I say just be aware. When you begin to inhale, you're aware that you're beginning to inhale. You're aware of the length of the inhalation and you're aware of the cessation of the inhalation. And then we breathe out. So we're aware of the beginning of the breathing out the duration of the breathing out and the cessation of the breathing out. And that's all we have to do. Yeah. Simple, huh? Yeah. Except all these thoughts keep arising, eh? Yeah. Now this is something that frustrates people. You know, I keep thinking. <laughs> so, well, yeah, of course you do. You've had a lifetime of it. You've had several lifetimes, several thousand million lifetimes of thinking. You know, it's habitual. We do it all the time. See, people are you know, sitting on the toilet planning their day. Oh, why can't you just sit on the toilet? <laughs> My stepfather used to sit on the toilet and read the paper. How much fun can that be? Mm. Mm. Can you go on the toilet go to the toilet? Mm. Do one thing at a time. Do it well. Enjoy it. Mm. So, <laughs> I was planning stuff. And this is what people do, they come to meditation and then they start to think and then they get upset. Don't get upset. It's what the mind's going to do. This is why I said before, we try to keep the precepts because the less we keep the precepts, the harder it is to, to remain mindful. You know, when we were sitting under the Bodhi tree and I, I was saying like when I was a bit of a bad boy, you know. So I'd have been out doing some vandalism or whatever else it was that I'd been up to at the time, which was fun at the time, until you get home and you realise that you may have been seen. Perhaps you left your fingerprint somewhere. Or <laughs> spray painted your name at the place that you just damaged and so that people knew who it was and then you suddenly realise well, that's a bit stupid. <laughs> 
And so you're sitting there trying to relax watching the television and you hear a car door slam and you think, oh, maybe there's the police coming or, you know, all these things. And how much more when you're trying to calm your mind down to meditate? So thoughts are naturally going to arise. As householders, you guys have got a lot of things on your plate. You know, get the kids to school. You know, you've got to get them up. I don't know, I mean, I was a rotten kid to get up. You know. <laughs> well, I didn't like school, which probably didn't help, but uh, get up, no. <laughs> get up, no, it's cold. <laughs> uh, too cold to get out of bed. No. It's not cold, yeah, it is. I, my mother used to say I was the only person she knew that could hear cold. <laughs> Cold as I can hear, it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> you can't hear cold. <laughs> I can. <laughs> and so we, you know, we do all these things we don't want to do. There's a lot of things we don't want to do. You know, we, you know, so we come up with excuses for not doing things, and it's like you know, we become very, very good at doing dumb stuff, and then eventually that dumb stuff comes back to bite us. And it comes back to bite us in our meditation, big time. And so we have to be very, very careful. So we try and keep our precepts, but these thoughts will still arise. They're still going to come up. You know? And so when they come up, we just see them that, you know, a thought has arisen. But we don't have to chase after the thought. Not necessary. A thought arises, so we just are aware briefly that a thought has arisen. And then we come back to the object of our meditation, which in this case is the breathing. But people get angry, <coughs> thinking. We try and get rid of anger, <laughs> not to develop anger. And so when thoughts arise, we don't get angry. You know, we just understand that a thought has arisen. The trouble is, we start chasing our thoughts. And often we can, like, you sit down to do a 30 minute meditation session, you realize you spent 25 minutes off chasing a thought somewhere. Uh, uh, and then we get angry, but well, it's okay. Instead of getting angry, we can actually just understand that we have a tendency to chase after our thinking. When we understand this, then we can cut that down. We, because, because we become aware of what we do, and then we start to cut it off and we know we just bring it back to this point here which is which is our breathing and so we do our breathing and then the mind wanders and it's like when we eventually realize it's wandered and boom and we bring it back and we bring it back lovingly and we bring it back gently and so we don't use anger in our meditation, because anger is one of the things that we're, we're trying to get rid of. And so we just come back and understand the breathing out and breathing out, breathing out, breathing out, you know, long breath, short breath. Well, there is more to Anapanasati than that. And there's actually 16 parts to the whole meditation. This is a very basic, basic understanding of it. But you know, there's the breathing out. So you're breathing in long, I know I'm breathing out. So we know internally and we know externally. So what's knowing the body externally? It's actually not knowing our body, it's, it's me. When I meditate and I understand that, you know, I breathe in long, I breathe out long, I breathe in long, I breathe out long. And then I also am aware that as I breathe in long, and breathe out long. So do others. This is the body externally. I now understand that other beings breathe in long, other beings breathe out long, other beings breathe in short, other beings breathe out short. And then it goes to the same with the, the feelings and the mind and the dharmas. You know, we understand that as, I, as feelings arise in me, feelings arise in others. And then it gets to you know, knowing that both those feelings arise in me and also feelings arise in others. So but that's not important at this stage. You know, 
the important part of this stage is just being able to keep the mind on the breath. And as I say, it's, it, it's not always easy. You know, we have these, these tendencies, these habits that we've had our entire life, and thinking is one of those habits. And of course, the other problem is see the mind. You got to think of the mind like a child. I'm sure you're all young enough to remember your childhood. Mm. I certainly remember mine. I was a horrible child, apparently, according to my mother. Mm. Mm. I used to deny this, but the more I think about it, I think she may have possibly had a point occasionally. I may not have been the best child to try and bring up. With our minds, And as I say, we had not only this lifetime, but many lifetimes of just letting our minds wander. You know, we, we get up in the morning, and yet yeah, to a degree we have to plan the day. You know, can't help that. I mean, if you catch the bus to work, you know you have to be up at a particular time to have breakfast, and to get out to the bus stop, to catch the bus, to get to here, to be able to walk to work, to be on, on time so your boss doesn't take you off. A certain amount of planning needs to be taking place. But we do too much planning. You know, we try to do too many things at one time. And I don't know how many of you people, I mean, you get up, you make a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, and you're sitting there, you've got the newspaper, and maybe the TV's on, you're listening to the news, or you know, in your place your kids are probably watching some cartoon program on television, and you've got the paper, TV's going, you've got your cup of tea, cup of coffee, and you reach for your cup of coffee, and it's empty. And you go, I don't remember drinking that. Well, of course you don't remember drinking that. You weren't focused upon it. You were trying to do three things at once. Drink coffee, read paper, watch television. You do all three of them badly. If you made a cup of coffee, and you didn't have the radio or the TV on, you didn't have your newspaper in front of you, and you just spent your time, you can feel the warmth of the coffee cup. You can smell the aroma of the coffee. You can taste the coffee. When you finish drinking that cup of coffee, you'll have known you've drunk it. And you will have enjoyed it. But that's not what we do, huh? We try to do so many different things at the one time. And so we don't actually enjoy anything. And so this is what our minds are like. They just we've allowed them to run riot for so long. And now we're trying to calm it down. And it's like, you know, it's like having a kid, a little kid. Kids love to play, huh? Kids just love to play. So your kids outside playing, you know, with these buddies, you know, kicking a rugby ball around or whatever it is. And he's been out there for ages, you know, running around having a really good time. And then all of a sudden mum or dad are like, oi, oi, you yeah, come in, time to come in and sit down and shut up. <laughs> you want me to do what? Like, sit down and shut up. <laughs> I was born to play. <laughs> I wasn't born to sit down and shut up. <laughs> and so you get it in its chair, you know, and it's like, it's a, it's a squirm. And so it just, you know, and it's going to continue to play in its mind. That kid's going to teach you a lesson. It's like, okay, I'm sitting here physically. <laughs> But on the inside, I'm still playing. <laughs> and our mind's exactly the same. You know, our mind's like a naughty child. It's been having so much fun, and then all of a sudden you're saying to it, all right, sit down and shut up. It's like, you what? <laughs> Not going to happen. And it will. It will rebel. It will rebel. And it will think of so many things. Somebody said to me once, uh, they're talking about Buddhists and vegetarianism. Mm -hmm. Always, that always crops up. And I say to people, look, no, a Buddhist doesn't have to be a vegetarian. Buddha did not make this a rule. Absolutely unnecessary, you know, from a Buddhist point of view. Blah, 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 blah. 
Vamos sair pato. Vamos sair if a Buddhist is vegetarian, I said, then when he sits down to meditate, his mind can't be going, bacon sandwich. <laughs> One less thing for the mind to worry about. Because yeah, the mind's funny like that, you know. If you like eating bacon sandwiches, you sit down to meditate, and the mind goes, what does he like? Bacon sandwiches. So I get up and have a sandwich. Mm, nice. <laughs> So if we can get up eating meat, of course this is one less thing for the mind to worry about. And this is the same with keeping the precepts. If we can keep the precepts, then it's one less thing that the mind can take us away from. You know? As soon as we start not keeping the precepts, then it becomes, these are the things the mind is going to chuck at us. Because it's essentially a bit naughty. It is like that little child. You know, it takes time. It's like, you know, when you get a puppy, you bring a puppy and you know, it wheeze on the carpet and it chews the furniture and eats your slippers and you know, all this sort of stuff. It takes time to teach the puppy not to do these things, you know, because it's just a puppy. And your mind's exactly the same, you know, it wants to chew your slippers. It takes some training. It takes, you know, when you get a puppy, you know, you know sit. Just what? <laughs> and it doesn't matter what language you say sit in. So that puppy still doesn't understand the concept of sit and the concept of stay. You know. It's just going to be jumping around and having fun. You know. And this is what our mind is like. Uh, and you know, eventually you can train the puppy. Or you can get frustrated and you just have a big dog that runs around ripping your house to bits. But we don't do that. We continue trying to train the puppy and eventually it will sit, it will stay. You know? And then you have a well-trained dog in the house. And we all know that that just does not happen overnight. You know? It takes patience on our behalf. And so whenever you get frustrated in your meditation, just remember, it's okay. It's going to take some time. The important thing is practice. Practice, practice, practice. You know, it's no use coming to the temple once every Buddha day. Oh, I'm going to do meditation, that's Buddha day. You won't get anywhere, you know, because the other 20 odd days between Buddha days that you're not practicing, you know, and everything that you do on one day, it's just gone again. So what we need to do, see the Buddha talks about go to a forest, go to the foot of a tree, go to a quiet place. Now, you know, you live in Kale, not a lot of forest about. You know, mm -hmm. A few trees around, which is quite nice, but no big forest. You know, you've still got cars busy past and those motorbikes that seem to make holes in there, you know, remove the baffles so that they make as much noise as possible. <laughs> Yeah, very difficult when you're sitting at the side of the road and underneath the tree. <laughs> but we try to find a quiet place. Now sometimes your house is the quiet place. You know, so what you do, you, you, you turn off your cell phone, you turn off the TV, turn off the radio, turn off the children. I don't know how you turn off children. <laughs> <laughs> Send them to the movies or something, I don't know. But you've got to say, look, this is going to be my quiet time. So you have to set a time. So whether it's six o'clock in the morning, say at six o'clock I'm going to meditate for X amount of minutes. Now if you're not an experienced meditator, do not say I'm going to sit and meditate for one hour. Because you ain't. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we say 15 minutes, 10 minutes. I'm going to sit for 10 minutes quietly. And you say to the husband, right, you, you're in charge of the kids, and if I hear one bleep out of them, I'm going to slap you up the side of the head. Lovingly, of course, because you're Buddhist. We don't slap it anger. <laughs> we, we slap it a lot. So I so say, I just need my 10 minutes. Please, can I have 10 minutes? So you find your quiet time. Now, it's important to try. Note the word try. Try to keep to that time. 
See, because when you turn around and go, well, you know, especially in the morning, you go, oh, well, I could sleep in for another 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. I know what, I'll do it when I get home from work. No, you won't do it when you get home from work. Mm -hmm. You'll find an excuse not to do it then as well. So set the time and try and keep the time. That's important. Now, so we've, we've decided we've got the place, we've got the time. So now we sit. Now, not all of us can sit in the full lotus position. And there are some purists who insist that you must. I would say that discriminates against one-legged people. A one-legged person cannot sit in the full lotus position. It ain't possible. And I'm quite sure the Buddha was not discriminatory against one-legged people. Okay? Some of us can sit cross-legged on the floor, some of us can't. Perhaps you've got arthritis, that could be a bit difficult. You know? So maybe we have to sit in a chair. That's okay, sitting in a chair is fine. If you sit in a chair, it's very important that you don't lean backwards. Leaning backwards is conducive to sleep. Leaning forward actually causes back and shoulder pain. So we try to remain erect. But be careful because I see some, <laughs> I see some of you, you see people sit down and meditate and they suddenly like, they get really rigid. Well that hurts as well. The back needs to be straight but it doesn't want to be rigid. You know, you're going to be in pain. And meditation is not about pain. You know, we don't need to hurt ourselves. The Buddha did stuff where he hurt himself. He said it doesn't work. He said it's utter rubbish. So we don't do that, you know. So the back is straight, but it's relaxed. Some people close their eyes. Some people half close their eyes. If you're going to half close your eyes, you need to make sure that your gaze is down, not up. Because if your gaze is up, even with half closed eyes, you see too many things. And that becomes a distraction. So we call it gaze downwards. You know. So the head wants to be fairly straight but tilted a little bit. Now then I say, oh, you know, some people say the right hand must be in the palm of the left hand. I don't think that's necessary either. You know. I mean, in actual fact, we're not talking about the body, we're talking about the mind. This is the important thing, is the mind, not the body. You know. But there is logic, trying to keep a straight back is logical because as I say, you can either fall asleep or you get into some pain. You know. The full lotus position gives you a very sturdy position. But us Westerners, for instance, you know, we're not used to sitting on the floor. Actually, we're used to laying down on the couch watching television. You know, we assume very relaxed positions in the West. So it's good to have a relaxed body. <laughs> Any excuse to lounge about like a lizard. So we do, we need to have a, a fairly straight back. And then it's just about trying to focus the mind on one particular thing. Now, so your mind wanders. If you say set a 15 minute period, don't sit there thinking for the next 15 minutes I'm going to sit here with a calm and tranquil mind. You're only going to disappoint yourself. <laughs> if we go into meditation expecting nothing, we cannot disappoint ourselves. If you get nothing, you got exactly what you were kind of expecting. And if you get something, then it's like, I got something. You might get five seconds where you can keep your mind on your breath. And for the rest of the time, your mind is off wandering. That's okay. You got five seconds, brilliant. You might get absolutely nothing. But when your meditation is going so badly, the important thing to remember is persist at it. Don't give up. So even if you have 15 minutes of utter and complete rubbish, at the end of 15 minutes, congratulate yourself on sitting there for 15 minutes persevering. The only bad meditation you'll ever do is the meditation you skip. 
anything else is still good, no matter what. And just be aware that just because you get five seconds this morning, don't sit down expecting five seconds tomorrow. <laughs> you could disappoint yourself. You, know? you might get more or you might get less. But the important thing is to keep that session going each time. If it's six in the morning, make it six in the morning. For 15 minutes, make it for 15 minutes. Don't skip it. That's bad meditation. There's no enlightenment from skipping. Otherwise, children in the playground would be very enlightened because they skip quite a lot, especially with girls. So we don't skip our meditation, we do it. Now, the more you do it, then the more you will actually look forward to doing it, and the more your mind will start to settle. As I say, it's like with a little puppy. You keep training it, doing the same thing day in, day out, day in, day out. Eventually the puppy learns to sit. It may not sit for as long as you want it to at first, but eventually it learns to study. And it's the same with our mind. Now once we start to get to that stage, then we can extend the bit. But don't jump from 15 minutes to 2 hours. Take it to 20, 25 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever. But don't overdo it. Because every time you extend it, it does become hard again. You know? Because you've gotten used to 15 minutes. So you try and jump it up to 30, that's actually quite, that's, you've doubled your time. And that can become difficult to do. So go for an extra five minutes. And then when you become comfortable with that, then extend it up again. We take up time. Now enlightenment's not going to be an overnight sensation. It may be for some of us. You know, I'm not saying it won't be, but you know, I'm saying on average it doesn't quite work like that. So we just slowly but surely we start to make some progress. And then we'll see that we're making progress. People often say, how do I know when I've made progress? It's like, you'll know. <laughs> Your mind will remain calm. Insights will start to arise. Okay. Oh, what about nimitta? Yeah, you love nimitta. You'll know. What is nimitta? Nimitta is a sign. What's the sign? Jhana. Jhana is a sign. Well, how do I know about jhana? You'll know when you've got jhana. Mm -hmm. But don't sit there thinking about it. Because see, this is the trouble with a lot of people, they read lots of books. See, Buddha was lucky, there weren't books around in Buddha's day, so people weren't reading books. Where people are going, oh, John is like this, John is like that. And so people are, oh, they read the book, and they should have this, this, this. Oh. And when they sit down to meditate, they can actually think they've got it, because they've read about it. You know? This is why books are horrible. I don't like books because there's too much information and people do think that they've got something. It's, it's, kind of, it's almost like guided meditation. I could actually trick you into thinking you'd meditated something. By giving you a guided meditation, I can fool your mind into thinking it's achieved something because it's believing what it's hearing. And this is why we have to meditate alone. And even if you sit, if the whole lot of you went and sat in the shrine hall this afternoon and meditated, that's still a quiet place. That's still a place of solitude. Because you're not sitting there chitty chatty. Each one of you is meditating individually. So you still have a quiet place. So we can find that quiet place just about anywhere. I'm going to wrap it up for now, so if there are any questions, if there are any questions, can I ask you to use the microphone, it's just that you would like to get the questions. Yeah, okay. Um, 
you even experience <laughs> meditators get pain, numbness in the legs and stuff. And yeah, there are, some people would say sit through the pain. Yeah, nah, not into that. What we don't do, we, we don't move immediately. We start to feel numbness. See, we can, when you start to feel numbness in your legs, your mind's actually already wandered. Okay? It's no longer, the breathing is no longer the object of meditation. Your mind has left the breathing. And so you can either ignore the pain and come back to the breathing, or you can make the pain the object of meditation. Now that's not to say I want you to sit there like if you do an hour's meditation and you've done 10 minutes, you know, I don't expect you to sit there for the next 50. Oh, this hurts. Because <laughs> that's not what it's about. But we can actually, okay, you've got pain, the legs have gone numb. Now the legs go numb for a reason, it's because of the way we're sitting, you know. And so we observe that, okay, there's this numbness. Now, first of all, do not sit there going, I've got pain in my legs. Because I've got pain uh, gives you ownership of a thing called pain. And, and I'm not quite sure why anybody would want to own something called pain. So we just understand that there is pain or pain has arisen. And we can examine how does the pain feel. Is it a sharp pain? Is it a dull pain? Because it's different. Is it a continuous pain? Well, sometimes, you know, like when you get a toothache, you know, it actually throbs and burr, burr, burr. A toothache is in a constant ache, you know, it just kind of thuds it away, thuds away, thuds away. So there are gaps. You can actually see that, you know, it's not continuous. There's actually pain, gap, pain, gap, pain, gap. When you get really clever, you can actually just focus on the gap in the end, gap, 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 and there's the pain, pain, pain. That takes some experience. But with your numb legs, yes, okay, there is numbness. How do I feel? Because emotions will start to arise with that numbness. You know? There's liking, there's disliking. You know? yeah, yeah, there are people out there that like pain. Huh? I believe there are I believe there are clubs that you can go to. <laughs> Strange. But there's liking and disliking, you know. So how do I feel about it, you know? Do I get angry? And if anger's arising, why? What am I angry at? Am I angry at myself? <laughs> am I angry at my legs? Am I angry at the floor? Whatever. Then change position. Now we change position slowly. Because we're mindful, we're mindful. This is when we get back to this general mindfulness, you know, now we're, uh, we're moving, you know, so now our mindfulness is getting quite general because it's not really focusing on one thing. But once you change position, then we see that pain goes away. Now we're looking at cause and effect. There was pain, there was a cause for the pain, the pain arose, then the situation changed, the pain went away. So now we're starting to see cause and effect. And we're starting to understand that we can change sometimes the way things are. We don't have to always accept that things are like this. If you break your leg, of course, the pain's quite quite real and it will stay there for some time unless you take painkillers. But a broken leg, a broken arm, something like that, it will hurt. You know? And it's not quite so easy. But that pain does eventually go away as well. It just takes a bit longer for it to go away. So we can see that often we can change the way things are. Sometimes we can't change the way things are. You know? So we begin to accept that we can either change it or we can't change it. And when we accept both of these things, you know, if we accept that we can't change it, then we start to let go of anger. It's not normal, it's just the way it is. You know. So we have to let it go. Stop worrying about it. If I can't change it, I can't change it. 
or we can change it, we can see that it was forced to worry about it in the first place. <laughs> you know. So we just understand that there is pain and it will either go away. I mean, actually pain is never, ever, it doesn't last forever. Because you will die one day. And there'll be no pain anyway, so pain is impermanent. <laughs> At the end of the day. It may seem like it's quite permanent, but it's not. Because we will all die. And then the pain stops until the next rebirth, in which case something else might come back that's painful. But yeah, you can change position. It's just, as I say, some people say sit through it, I think that's ridiculous. Because you actually end up, you're not meditating, you just, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what it's about. But I like the part about uh, being asking us to 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 not give up, just persist and meditate every day, even for fifteen minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, what if we, if we do that and um, like what the sister suggests, we keep experiencing pain. Maybe the whole fifteen minutes is all pain, and we just note it. And maybe we thought, oh, it's not a good session, but anyway, it's meditation. Oh, it does. If you see, what you have to do is you're now going to decide that you're going to make. If you're going to sit through the pain. You've changed the object of meditation. But that's okay. If you've decided that the pain is going to be the object of meditation, then that's all right. But I would suggest if you're in pain every day, change the position. Yeah. You know. Sitting on the chair is fine. Yeah. Meditation. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's what I, I mean, you know, you get these people who try to persist on sitting on the floor, but if you're going to be in agony all the time, you're not really going to get far in your meditation. Definitely won't happen every day. Yeah. But Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's like anything else, you see. When, when we first start off, it can become quite a chore. It's just so difficult. But, yeah, you can get to the stage where you actually look forward to meditating. But then, you see, you've got to be careful with that, too. <laughs> because you look forward to the meditation practice. Now, I don't know, if you've got kids, for instance, so you said, like, at six o'clock in the morning, I'm going to meditate every day for 15 minutes. And then you wake up one morning at quarter to six and your kid's so sick you have to take it to the hospital. Now you could have become so attached to the meditation session and you're like, oh, what the heck, you're going to get sick for you know, and just cut in the money. You know? <laughs> and, and people can get like that, people can get angry because something comes up where they can't get that meditation time in, you know. So we, so we do have to be very, very careful that you know, meditation actually doesn't become something of a hindrance, you know, because, yeah, I've, I've seen people, oh, I'm supposed to be meditating right now. You know, I'm, I'm sorry I was dying, you know, I'll go to the neighbours and See, if they can do something about my heart today, you can just get back to your practice. <laughs> have a nice day, you know. And, but no, people are like that, you know, so we have to be... But yeah, I mean, it's, it's better to look forward to meditation than to and dislike meditation. That's why I say about moving when you're in pain. Because I've known people who've done uh, some courses where they've been told, sit through it. And, and they're doing like an hour's sitting meditation and they're told that they have to sit in the full lotus position. And these are brand new beginners, you know, never meditated before in their lives and they're told to sit for an hour in the full lotus position and told, if there's pain, sit through it, 
don't change position. And they leave the course. By the way, we had very good word, and they weren't serious. What? What do you mean they weren't serious? You were just stupid. You tried to make somebody sit through something that was agonizing. And the Buddha did stuff like that. He said it's not the way. Yeah, we don't try to we don't try to run away from pain. We actually need to understand that, you know, this body suffers with pain. That's part of the nature of this body, you know. Old age, sickness and death. You know. So we need to understand pain. We don't run away from it, but we don't actually sit there having to endure it. You know, it's just ridiculous. So we, you know, we, and that, and people do they they go through on some of these courses, and then they come out the other end. They're damaged goods, you know. And they just they say, oh no, I can't meditate. I can't bear the thought of of that meditation cushion. They they see that meditation cushion, and they have feelings of hatred arise in them, you know. And so we can go the opposite way. You know? So we can either hate it and not want to do it, we can get to the stage that, yeah, as I say, it's good to want to meditate, but we still have to be aware that sometimes things come up in our lives and it's not possible. You know, and there is where we have to be careful. It's like, oh, okay. You know. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, when sleep says to you, oh, no, you should stay in bed for 15. That's just not, that's not the same as a child that needs hospitalization. Uh, you know, it's just sleep playing on you. There's that high and luxurious bed getting to you but you know yeah it, it's it's good to want to meditate you know? but we do have to realize that sometimes other things will need to take priority even as monks you know we we might decide you know you might oh yeah i'm gonna have a session this afternoon and then all of a sudden you know somebody's knocking on your door going oh we need you to go to a funeral so, oh man how could somebody die <laughs> no consideration whatsoever. <laughs> My meditation time, you know, don't these, don't these people think of anybody but themselves? <laughs> no? But you know, what, what can you do? You've got to get up and go to the funeral. Huh? <laughs> and you can't be sitting there saying to the relatives, well, he was a bit off with his timing. I was trying to have a meditation session, you know, so I'm not going to transfer the merits to him anyway. <laughs> <laughs> We can't be going down that road, huh? <laughs> uh, anybody else? If not, we'll take a break. Uh, soon I'll be doing the Dana Puja. How was the beginning meditation class? Beginning meditation class on the first and and third Wednesday, and we will start to turn off uh, the recorder. Press the red button. The red button in the middle. Okay, so um, there's a beginner's meditation class here on what? When? The first and the third. Is it the first and third Wednesday? Yes. <laughs> first and the third Wednesday, seven thirty. The first and the third Wednesday of the month at seven thirty. Uh, the PH, PH, PH in the Hall, 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 Hall. is about based on the Mahasatipatana, means Vipassana meditation. Then we, and you all have your uh, question answered there, because like, like this brother, when you talk about pains, you know, it's on the four foundations, it's on the, on the body, on the feeling, on the, on the mind and on the Dhamma. So it means on the investi- uh, the last one means Cita Nupasana, Kaya Nupasana, Liking, yes. disliking, drowsiness, distractions, so, yeah. yes. and doubts. <laughs> I could see some confused faces there. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the five hindrances liking, disliking, drowsiness, distractions, and doubts. The Pali scholar over here. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we'll take a break now. Um.